And without further ado, over to our guest speaker. Uh, this is Alvin Lam. He is a Hong Kong native who, for a very circuitous route, has uh, come back to the city of his birth uh, and undertaken a, a career as an artist. So he's going to share a little bit with that, about that with us today uh, and his thoughts on the theme of treasure. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Thanks for everyone being here and thanks for having me. Um, I can feel a lot of love already <laughs> uh, for everyone getting up so early and being here. Thank you. Um, so, all right, I'm going to dive right into it. Yeah. Um, so, long before I picked up chopsticks, I've already picked up a paintbrush. And much of my childhood was spent at the desk, drawing and painting, sketching. And as a child, I grew up on Hong Kong Island. You know that saying that when you live on Hong Kong Island, you'd never cross the harbor to the dark side? <laughs> it's true, right? Um, so much so that the very first time I ever stepped foot on, in Shem Shui Po, I was in shock. <laughs> the, chaos, the density, the intensity, and the rawness of it all, I sometimes felt like I was in a dystopia. Now, around age 16, I went abroad for school, and where I went, there were hardly any Hong Kongers. By the time I returned uh, after uni, honestly, I could barely even speak Cantonese, and uh, I was even frequently mistaken as a tourist. I often felt like a stranger to my own hometown, and Hong Kong, a stranger to me. Fast forward a couple years, I began my dream job as a flight attendant, and my job allowed me to travel, see the world, to experience the beauty, and discover all the hidden gems of each city. And I carry my sketchbook uh, wherever I traveled to and sketched along the way. Yet, through all these years, there was still one place yearning to be truly discovered and appreciated, and that was my own hometown. Around 2019, I've left my life of flying behind, moved into yet another hospitality field. Work was honestly insane at times. And, and so on one day off, I decided to do something I haven't really done before in Hong Kong. I dusted off my watercolor kit, brought my little stool, and uh, with a bit of courage, I came to the Graham Street wet market in Central, propped my seat down, and started my very first urban sketch in Hong Kong. Now, does this look familiar to a lot of you? Yeah. So this is a very special place to me. Among my somewhat blurry childhood memories, I never forget these trips with my mother to this market, where we'd buy wonton wrappers, from the old noodle maker, still around. We'd buy swimming fish with a fishmonger at the corner, even live chicken. Now, remember how folks used to blow on the bums of a chicken <laughs> when you buy a live chicken? My mom totally did that. I swear that's probably illegal these days. <laughs> now, these were special memories. Yeah, ask me about blowing on a bum of chicken later. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. And, you know, these, these are uh, very special memories. Hello. Yeah. And after so many years, I was happy to see that some of these shops are still around, even, although most of this market has already disappeared due to a massive urban redevelopment project. I knew it is only a matter of time that whatever remains would one day vanish as well. And so on my very rare days off, I began painting these seemingly ordinary, mundane places, places that we often pass by, but could just as easily overlook. Each of my paintings take typically weeks up to a month to complete, build layer upon layer. And I insist on doing uh, painting on location as much as I can, because that really allows me to slow down and fully immerse myself into my surroundings to over time develop a relationship with the shopkeepers, to study every little detail through participant observation. 
and while in the process trying not to get run over by a car. <laughs> not only does this process greatly enrich my paintings, most importantly, it gives them soul. Now, many of these shops have been around since mid last century. Many of them are uh, family run, passed down from generation to generation. And each one of them has such a rich story to share. And while each of these stories can perfectly stand on its own, collectively, as I later came to realize, they tell the story of the rise of Hong Kong. It is a story of perseverance and dedication. And without knowing, little by little as I build my collection, I've embarked on this journey of rediscovering my hometown, a place that often felt so familiar, yet at the same time, so foreign. And over time, as my curiosity grew, what started off originally really just as a hobby slowly turned into a mission, a mission to capture these disappearing, often untold stories of Hong Kong, and a mission to preserve our memories and the memories of so many ordinary yet totally extraordinary individuals who've really helped build the Hong Kong that we know today. And so by late 2020, just a few years back, at the height of the pandemic, I quit my job. I handed in a letter to pursue this mission of mine because I knew it was either now or never. And so from Mrs. Chen, the lovely chestnut roaster at the flower market in Mong Kok, to Uncle Choi, Hong Kong's very last birdcage maker uh, at the bird market in Prince Edward, to Oi Men Sang, the Dai Pai Dong. Anyone's been here before? Raise your heads. Yeah. Well, this is definitely uh, my favorite. Uh, it's also family run, third generation, Dai Pai Dong in Sham Shui Po. And uh, you might be aware, uh, there's only about 25 Dai Pai Dongs left in Hong Kong. This is one of them. And uh, to most recently, this is one that I completed just a few months back, the Look Brothers, Hong Kong's very last coppersmiths, who've also announced they'll be retiring this year. My work has taken me all across Hong Kong, covering diverse trades in literally what I consider a race against time. I think all of us here remember or recall just how much we have lost in just the past one year. Let's take a walk down a little bit of a memory lane. From Biu Ki, the Mahjong Tao Carver in Jordan, Lin Hung Tea House, the legendary century old dim sum parlor in Central, the beloved bakeries in Wan Chai to Kowloon City, Hong Kong's very last sawmill, the list goes on and on and on. And whether it is to make way for urban redevelopment or businesses finally caving under the pressures of the pandemic, the speed at which old shops are closing down is truly staggering. And while some have received widespread media attention and public response, and even since then reincarnated and continued business, actually some of them have reopened in the last year, not all received the same attention, like Mr. Lai, whose story I'll now share. For years now, every time I pass by Shang Wan and come upon this little shack at the bottom of the steps on Tong Street, just off of Cat Street, I'd pause and watch as this elderly couple hammers away, bending metal sheets, making mailboxes by hand. You see, there was a time in Hong Kong when almost everything was made locally by hand. The metalworking industry, like many other traditional trades and crafts, took off in around the 1960s when Hong Kong was rapidly growing. Metal mailboxes, we're very familiar with these, are we? Metal mailboxes, they adorn the entrances of every walk-up building, little businesses, shops, and village homes. Metal containers, metal foldable tabletops, metal buckets, all of these became household essentials. The introduction of plastic and then the arrival of mass production changed everything. And as the demand for 
metal craftsmen declined one after another metal, works, uh, work, metal smith workshops started disappearing. Eventually, as the years went by, Mr. Lai became one of Hong Kong's very last uh, metal mailbox makers. Now, like many of our grandparents' generation, Mr. Lai was born in China and came to Hong Kong as a child. He started apprenticing as a teenager and learned the craft from a master. By his 30s, he's worked his way up to opening his very own shop up on Hollywood Road, and it's around the 1980s when he and his wife finally settled in this little workshop in, on the steps in Tong Street and became a familiar face to all who live in this neighborhood. Around two years ago, a friend of mine, Zemo, had a broken KitchenAid mixer. A pin was jammed, and no matter how hard he tried, he simply could not remove it. He was pretty frustrated. And so he lugged this heavy thing all across town to every hardware store, metal workshop that he could find to ask for help. Every single person rejected him, like, oh, no, 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 you know. It doesn't help that Zemo doesn't really speak Cantonese. <laughs> yeah. And that was until he came to Mr. Lai, despite his, despite the language barrier, despite frailty of his body, Mr. Lai took the machine, grabbed one of his tools, and with a very strong yank, knocked the pin out. And that was that. He waved Zemo off and refused to accept any money. This little act of kindness is precisely the kind of human touch that makes these stories so especially precious. I was determined to capture Mr. Lai's story, but by the summer of that year, Mr. Lai's shop was closed. It remained closed after several more visits, and I began to worry. I asked around and was told that Mr. Lai was never coming back. I was distraught, quite disappointed, even devastated that I haven't come around sooner, that I might have already missed my chance. Then, eight months later, I saw a note stuck on Mr. Lai's shack. It read, call this number if you need to purchase goods or for inquiries. It was like a glimmer of hope. But still, I waited two more weeks till I finally found the courage to call this number. <laughs> it was I finally called, and uh, it was Mrs. Lai who picked up. I asked Mrs. Lai, are, are you going to open again? And is there any chance I might still be able to pick up a couple of mailboxes? Mrs. Lai told me to come back the following day, for she and her son Benny will be there cleaning up, packing up, and closing up shop for good. Mr. Lai had fallen ill. And so the next day, I packed all my painting gear, my little stool, got there, and this was when I really had, I was really able to have a chance to have a closer look at some of the tools and equipment that Mr. Lai had been using all these decades. Some of these tools were handcrafted by Mr. Lai himself. Some inherited from other metalsmiths who've retired over the years. Some even aged well over a century, like the wooden stump in the corner every metal workman would have a tree stump like this. Check that out when you visit, or when you pass by any, in the, um, even the coppersmiths that I painted earlier. I, I asked, so what's going to happen to all these tools? And um, son Benny told me that they'll all be taken to the metal recycling in a dump on that day. I was shocked. Because to me, every piece, every piece of, every worn out tool was like a relic. It was a testament to a chapter in Hong Kong's story that really should be preserved and treasured. I was lucky to be able to acquire a couple of these tools. The rest, unfortunately, will be forever lost to history. And so in the following weeks, I continued working very hard on this painting. Really, it was a race against time. And it is common practice that at the end, when I complete a painting, I would go back and gift a framed print to the family as a way to express my gratitude. 
And on the very, very day that I completed this painting, February 16th of last year, I received a call. Mr. Lai had passed away that morning, literally on the day that I finished the painting. For decades, Mr. Lai had been crossing that harbor from his home in Wang Tai Sin all the way to Sheng Wan, climbing up these steps, working, making mailboxes by hand until he literally physically could no longer do so. He was 92 years old. And just like that, by sheer chance and fate, I became a witness to the closing of yet another chapter in Hong Kong's story. The end of an era. There was no elaborate ceremony, no bells and whistles, like a tree falling in a forest without making a sound. Mr. Lai may have gone, but his story lives on. It goes to show how things can just disappear in an instance without us noticing in this fast-paced world. Had I not made that call that one day, I might have truly missed my one and only chance. And Mr. Lai is just but one example. There are countless others. While building my collection, it didn't take long for me to start noticing a common thread that links all my pieces together. Most of these businesses started around the same period of unprecedented economic growth in Hong Kong. We're talking about the 1950s, 1960s, and it would still be a long way to go before free education came into existence in Hong Kong. And it was not uncommon at that time that youngsters would follow their parents' footsteps and begin apprenticing in specialized trades in as early as their teens. For them, for many of them, it was a way for survival. But then the rise of modern technology and growing competition from cheap mass-produced imports started to shake things up. Things that used to be made to last are now replaced by disposables. Individual craftsmen gradually replaced by machines, by factories. Better access to education also meant that a new younger generation is now looking elsewhere for better work opportunities and for good reasons. And as the older generation retires, many trades are left with no successors to carry on. One after another, these family-run, multi-generation businesses that have once very much been the backbone of Hong Kong society begin to disappear. Muscled out by bigger, stronger industry players, falling victim to Hong Kong's skyrocketing rent, and now, more so than ever, increasingly being pushed up by gentrification and outdated policies. Everywhere, the things and places that have once given Hong Kong its truly unique color, character, heritage, and identity are vanishing before our eyes, taking away with them an irreplaceable piece of our city's history, legacy, and memory. They are the silent witnesses of a rapidly evolving Hong Kong, caught in a crossroads as a society marches down this dangerous path that seems to be increasingly favoring uniformity, monotony, and monopoly. Each one is like a thread that weaves whole communities together. And one by one, like a thread being pulled out, this fabric forming our cultural landscape, our cultural identity, and our sense of community starts to slowly unravel and fall apart. This is hardly a phenomenon unique to Hong Kong. It is happening globally. Not all is gloom and doom, however. There's still a silver lining for some twilight industries. Thanks to increased media coverage, growing public awareness, some dying crafts are also seeing a revival in interest. So earlier this year, I returned to the bird market and paid Uncle Choi a visit. 
Uncle Choi, he's now、um, 80 years old. No matter rain or shine, you will find him still at his shop, patiently repairing bird cages. And I was delighted to learn that Mr. Uncle Choi now has this team of young, devoted apprentices who are eager to learn this ancient craft of bird cage making. And you know, through these years, through this journey, I realized that you know, while progress is absolutely necessary and inevitable, as we're moving forward, it is important that we also remember the steps that led us here today. And since I've begun this project, I've gained a newfound appreciation for old shops and businesses. And while I appreciate the convenience of supermarkets, don't we all, right? I find myself sometimes also gravitating towards the human touch of market stalls, of little old neighborhood stalls where you can talk or have a little conversation. And now, when I walk into Sham Shui Po, I look at my surroundings with wonder and fascination. I find beauty in the chaos. And every time, I still discover something new, something I've missed before, even though they've literally been in plain sight for over half a century. I realize that treasure isn't necessarily always something hidden or something elusive. Treasure can be something that's been present around us all along, right before our eyes. And like Mr. Lai's humble mailboxes, like his ancient tools, like many of the shops that I painted, treasure can obviously be something physical, something tangible. It can also be intangible, like heritage, a distant memory, or like an unforgettable, unforgettable experience or story that gets passed on. No matter how we define treasure. There is one universal element, invaluable and irreplaceable. And so, next time when you're out and about, slow down, look up from your phones, look around you and listen, explore your explore your neighborhood, rediscover your neighborhood, strike up a conversation and make a human connection, and you might. Find the most extraordinary treasures in the most ordinary places. Hong Kong is truly a treasure trove of stories to discover, and we could be the very last generation to ever witness and experience this remarkable chapter in Hong Kong's story. And there are many ways we can honor and,、uh, and continue this unique legacy, beginning with. As simply as reflecting on the way we consume, become more mindful of the choices that we make every day, how we shop and where we eat, how we as individuals can contribute and support and grow this local community that we have, and the step that I take is to capture and tell these often untold stories of Hong Kong's treasures through paper and watercolor. What's yours? Thank you.、Yeah. Hi there. I have a tough question.、Um, I'll try my best. <laughs> so you said you used to live on the island side, but now visiting all these places, have you moved to the dark side? I absolutely have. I've actually, for the last you know, dec- more than、uh, more than decade and a half now, I've been around different places. I have moved way up north. Um, for a couple of years, oh God, what was that called? <laughs> what were you doing? Things like that. So I was absolutely, I was having a cultural shock for two years, <laughs> and、uh, I've also lived on Lantau for at least seven years, and now I'm I'm living near Sham Shui Po, and honestly, that was in a way it's a blessing because that has allowed me to really. Entirely discover this neighborhood that I've always been, honestly, a little bit afraid of. <laughs> It, you know, as a kid, I have memories of going to even like the Wan Chai Computer Center, 
or Shenzhou Pro, and I, I really get very terrified. I think it's the claustrophobia or like the people and a lot of cigarettes at that time. <laughs> so things have changed. And but yeah, uh, I am in the dark side and I'm loving it. <laughs> but I still commute to Hong Kong side quite often. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Thank you guys. Any other questions? Um, so clearly you built like a really good relationship with all the store owners with the pictures. Um, but I want to ask, what were the initial reactions when you showed up and said, hey, I want to start meeting you? Oh, wonderful question. I mean, I've, I've gone through quite a journey with this myself as well. It's a trial and error process where in the beginning, I, I'm just so shy and, you know, I, I would just prop myself down and start painting and they'd be like, look at me. Like, like, you know, I try to avoid eye contact, but you can't really because you're staring at them. Um, uh, and, and gradually, after a few paintings, I, I realized you know, talk to them, obviously. And especially when I keep painting, I, I started really getting the details. I start taking longer and longer time with every painting. So it's absolutely essential that I start building a rapport with them early on. Uh, yeah, but um, no, generally, everyone is very, very, very warm, very welcoming. You will get different personalities uh, once in a while that obviously they are not familiar with this. You know, to have someone sitting there in front of you for like weeks. <laughs> um, but, but all the more rewarding that is, that after some time, you went from cold to warm, and you, you almost start as if you're building this kind of relationship. You're keeping each other's company, like um, the barber here in, um, on uh, Shengwang Street. We have a resident on Shengwang Street. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, he's one example where in the beginning, uh, I literally have to keep my backpack on to be re ready to run any minute. <laughs> <laughs> so at the end, you know, passing him this painting, and it was absolutely a touching, touching uh, moment. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Oh. Twice. <laughs> and a shave. Experience, really an experience to have. Yeah. <laughs> See a young woman working there now. Do you know if he's actually retired? Is he still cutting hair? So glad you mentioned that because I've actually been wondering that myself. Um, so the barber, by the way, he never shared, he never disclosed his name. That's why he's the barber. Uh, yeah. I've actually also been wondering, especially this year, because I've noticed he has not been opening. I have not seen him around. And uh, I was also getting worried. Hmm. He, he was already 90 years old. Yeah. Still with very steady hands. Oh. Uh, yeah. And I've seen uh, a couple of times a younger woman was, I just happened to pass by and someone was closing the gate. So, ah, so maybe it has been taken over then. Okay. Um, cool, guys, we've just got time for a couple more questions. I had one over here. Just quick question for you is, other than Sun Trade Po, um, what are some of these places that have brought you to these unexpected parts of Hong Kong? And where would you recommend for you know, anybody looking to rediscover parts of Hong Kong um, to go out and explore? You know, the fact that every neighborhood has such a rich history and uh, Sun Trade Po for sure would be on the top of my list. Uh, and you know, that actually extends all the way, you know, to Yao Mate, uh, Mong Kok Yao Mate. Just get off the main streets. Mm -hmm. That's when you start stop seeing all those big generic chains, you know, on every main street. And you start seeing these tiny little shops. And um, in Hong Kong Island, again, even though we have seen quite a bit of gentrification, but Shang Wan and Sang Pun still remains one of the most fascinating uh, areas. Uh, we, you will still find, uh, obviously, you know, all the um, seafood shops, the dried seafood shops, uh, hardware stores, grocery shops. These are all places that every time passing by just completely captivate me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, before. Before we start, 
I also have something very exciting to share. <laughs> yes. Right, go ahead. Yeah. Well, um, I, I'd love to reveal a brand new painting that I've literally just completed yesterday. Oh. Yeah. And uh, yeah, before everyone starts heading to work. Why don't I take that out? Okay. We'll just do, we'll do one yeah. last question. I just wondered if you'd come across the printer on Wellington Street that was, I haven't seen him for a long time, and he had an amazing setup. That really old printer, I think he always used to do it by hand. Is it where it's kind of heading that little slope? Oh, so it oh, is that one. So the one kind of near Lin Hang Tea House? Yeah. Yeah, just further down. That, oh, they've been closed for ages now. And that is definitely one of my biggest regrets. Yeah. I don't, because I, 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 I believe do. they closed quite a while ago. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that would have been a place I absolutely wanted to capture. Uh -huh. Yeah. And that place is the same deal. Yeah. 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 Right. I, I remember being absolutely fascinated yeah. by it. It was just a guy, literally, and the, the shop was only yeah. like two feet deep. Yeah. And he was right on the edge of the road, yeah. and it just almost, it was like a little cave, as you say. Yeah. I definitely have a picture of it. I will, I will dig yeah. out and share. Oh, cool, guys, that's, that's all we have time for in terms of questions, but okay. I'm excited to see this finished work. Yeah. I'm very excited because I hardly ever get to show the original piece, um, but this is also quite a special piece to me. Um, wow. <laughs> Magic, yeah, yeah. So this one, yeah. Mr. Wong, um, beloved, absolutely beloved by many. Uh, in Cantonese, he's been known to many, many as uh, Suiko Papa, the ice cream grandpa or ice cream uncle, and uh, he has already become to me quite a legendary figure. I've started hearing about him uh, the very first time I did a pop-up. Some of you actually met me the very first time when I did a pop-up. Uh, and there were people who told me about his stories, like, oh, have you heard about Ice Cream Uncle? I'm like, no. And actually over the years, every time I did a show, a pop-up, people are like, you have to paint him. And so this is something I had on my mind for years and I finally, finally tackled. So, Obviously, this is one that I'm not able to do on a spot, for uh, Mr. Wong had already passed away. Um, so, the ice cream uncle actually spent the last 60 to 70 years pushing his ice cream cart for long distances. He would always park it in Prince Edward, push uphill all the way to uh, North Shakit May, almost to like to Kowloon area and park his cart outside of this school, the Mary Knoll's fa Mary Knoll Father's School, primary school. And uh, for all these decades, he's literally become an icon, like became a part of generations of students and faculty's life. And a constant, really, a regular constant that all, that's always there. And there's so many stories of these students, you know, running to him after school, whether even the, the, the teachers, whether you're having a good day or a bad day, everyone always go to him for a little sweet treat and it always brings a smile. And um, in 2016, so that's when one day people realize that he's no longer there. And, uh, you know, for a while, every, there was a lot of talk. It's like, oh, you know, I wonder, everyone's wondering how he's doing. And um, yeah, so, it was found out that he fell ill, you know, he, he moved into an elderly home, but then uh, someone even got him on a, like a FaceTime to announce that I'm doing fine, you know? And you know, what, just what's remarkable is that all those years, he's become such a important part of people's lives that he's been invited to every school anniversary. Uh, and uh, you know, the school was founded in 1957. And he was already there bef witnessing how this neighborhood transformed. He witnessed the construction of the school. And he literally has students graduating, coming back as parents with their kids, coming back as a teacher in the same school. 
and He is still there every day. And that's why I found it so important that not only do we have um, the, the students in this painting, also an adult with a baby, you know, signif you know sim symbolically it's, you know, these generations of um, people that He watched and grew up with. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs>